century are many. For instance, the correspondence principle ensures that quantum mechanics gives the same results as classical physics when we apply it not to elementary particles, which is its usual domain, but to systems of much larger dimensions. Using the correspondence principle, physicists can choose from among possible quantum theories. The acceptable theories are those that reduce to classical mechanics in some appropriate limit. We see this happening also when physicists adjust quantum mechanics to make it consistent with special relativity. To achieve this, they assume that instead of particles, we have quantum mechanical, a quantum mechanical system for each point in space. The correspondence principle has a role here as well. It ensures that the field theory remains consistent with the descriptions in terms of attributes of particles. The non-relativistic limit of the quantum mechanical field theory needs to reduce to the non-relativistic quantum theory of particles. Not everyone agrees that the limit case of quantum mechanics reproduces classical physics in all respects, even as regards its ontological implications. Some indeed claim that the gap between classical and quantum mechanics is very deep, that these two approaches represent different ways of doing physics, and that they describe different worlds. Nevertheless, it seems undeniable that at the basic empirical level, in other words, at the level of the mathematical structure of the equations involved, and at the level of efficiency in predicting observables, there is always some role for the principle of correspondence. Otherwise, we would have to sacrifice the ideal of a unified, self-consistent physics. Although the correspondence principle was recognized as important in the context of quantum mechanics, it had been present in other cases where the domain of validity of a new theory included the domain of a previous theory. For instance, as regards special relativity, the correspondence principle is evident in the way Einstein's special theory becomes equivalent to classical mechanics when the velocities are small when compared to the speed of light. It is present also in the way Einstein's the general theory reduces to Newton's theory when the gravitational field is weak. We see the correspondence principle at work also in the way that statistical mechanics <coughs> reduces to thermodynamics as the number of particles tends to infinity. My proposal in this paper is to explore how we can understand and use this correspondence principle in a broader sense. Some physicists have already attempted to extend the role of the principle beyond the confines of physics. For instance, Werner Heisenberg, in his book Physics and Philosophy, seeks correspondence between his new ideas about elementary particles and Aristotelian ideas. Quote, all the elementary particles are made of the same substance, which we may call energy or universal matter. There are just different forms in which matter can appear. If we compare the situation with Aristotelian concepts of matter and form, we can say that the matter of Aristotle, which is mere potentia, should be compared to our concept of energy, which gets into actuality by means of the form when the elementary particle is created. In these cases, Heisenberg is applying the correspondence principle in a very broad sense. He is seeking conceptual consistency between domains of validity that we often keep apart, namely the domain of empirical sciences and that of philosophy. In this paper, I propose to follow up on what Heisenberg was doing in this paragraph. I propose to seek consistency or correspondence not just between empirical theories, but between disciplines. The domain over which I would like to establish consistency is very wide indeed. It goes from the domain of quantum mechanics to that of philosophy and theology. My contribution will not be scientific as such. I will not be proposing a solution to the mathematical challenges of quantum mechanics. 
many bright physicists are working hard on these issues and I am not questioning their competence in any way. What I can offer is a modest philosophical contribution. I am interested in how our understanding functions at a deep level. We are very often affected by hidden ideas or cognitive dispositions inherited from our past. In what follows, my basic assumption is that some underlying mental imagery affects our understanding. The underlying mental imagery is not equivalent to a set of assumptions, it is pre-conceptual. Our recourse to it is often unconscious. It is like a habit of mind. We can, of course, explore it, but in doing so, we bring it to the surface. We articulate it. We present it in the form of a set of assumptions, and thereby destroy its characteristic of being underlying mental imagery. Long-term conditioning happens at various levels. The mental imagery takes shape from education within a specific tradition or culture, but its origins can go back also into further way back into our past. Some of its aspects derive from our hominid ancestors' primordial experience of intersubjective agreement regarding the sensible world and from their simple religious convictions. From these origins, we have inherited some forms of underlying mental imagery that are relevant when discussing issues related to realism and knowledge. We are predisposed to assume that the observer does not create the observed and that there is a correct description of the world, whether we like it or not. We are predisposed also to extrapolate our perception to a higher viewpoint. We picture a universal viewpoint. God knows all things. God is always there. There is a lot to explore in this area, but in this paper, I need to focus on one aspect only. I will explore the underlying mental imagery at work when we discuss the problems of quantum mechanics. I will focus on two points only, reality and completeness. In all this, my guiding question will be the following. What can we learn what can we learn if we extend the correspondence principle all the way from quantum mechanics to theology, especially if we refer to our underlying mental imagery? First section questions concerning reality. These last decades, physics has apparently arrived at the conclusion that reality is confounding. Quantum mechanics makes accurate predictions, but apparently leads to inconsistency. For some physicists, we should now admit that reality is irrational. Richard Feynman uses the word absurd. He wrote the following. Physicists have learned to realize that whether they like a theory or not, whether they like a theory or they don't like a theory, is not the essential question. Rather, it is whether or not the theory gives predictions that agree with experiment. Nature is absurd from the point of view of common sense. The theory of quantum electrodynamics describes nature as observed from the point of view of common sense. And it agrees fully with experiments. So I hope you can accept nature as she is, absurd. Feynman said this back in the 1980s. Since then, the absurdity of nature implied by quantum mechanics seems to have been definitely confirmed by experiment. The two most surprising features are probably the collapse of the wave function caused by the act of measurement and the non-locality of reality. The first issue derives from the fact that the wave function describing a system has the form of a linear superposition of different possible states of the system. When we make a measurement, we find one definite state, the actual one. Any further development of the system depends on that measurement. This seems to show that when we measure, we are changing something fundamental. We are, as they say, collapsing the wave function from the suspended realm of possibility to the concrete realm of actuality. The other issue involving non-locality arises when we have a system with at least two particles. 
According to quantum mechanics, the two particles are initially in a non-separable state, described by a superposition of the possible states of each. A measurement on one of these particles will cause changes in the quantum mechanical description of the other, no matter how far apart they are from each other. This is shocking, because the primordial idea of physical causation always includes, involves the cause physically touching, as it were, its effect directly or indirectly. Causation is always local in this sense. To push you, I need to be in contact with you, either personally or through some instrument. Here, however, a change in one particle has an effect on another particle without any physical contact whatsoever. The causation involved seems to be faster than light. Such effects are therefore very surprising. In line with the interpretation of the formalism accepted by the majority of physicists, the best way to deal with these surprising features is to accept that we need to revise our semantic rules, especially those regarding the use of predicates. We need to accept that for a system in a superposed state, we are not allowed to speak about the attributes of the system. We cannot say that the particle is both spin up and spin, spin down, or that it is both black or non-black. According to this interpretation, a superposed state does not refer to, or correspond to, or manifest a complex and surprising form of reality. The superposition is just a mathematical device. It certainly does not prove that reality deep down is inherently inconsistent. We can allow superposition mathematics, but we cannot allow it for predicates. To know the attribute of the electron, we need to measure. Measurement tells us whether the electron has the attribute or its contrary, whether it is, say, black or non-black. But it does not tell us how the electron was before the measurement. This, in brief, is the standard story. I want to explore now how our understanding is functioning at a deeper level. I want to explore the underlying mental imagery that determines the element of surprise. Physicists and philosophers have expressed surprise. Why does this, where does this surprise come from? We have here an underlying mental imagery that relates all the way back to the mechanistic worldview of the 17th and 18th centuries. The assumption was then that the real essence of things lies in their microstructure. Micro properties expose reality. Macro properties, those we are aware of in everyday life, are an illusion, and we should therefore give priority to the physics of microparticles. I am convinced that the perplexing aspect of the measurement problem arises, at least partially, from this conceptual disposition. This is somewhat like a set of Russian dolls. We think that the ultimate answer as regards reality lies within the smallest doll. We start with the hope of arriving at a simple explanation of everything in terms of a small number of elements and their various combinations. And then this hope is shattered by the alarming conclusion that action within microsystems is not local and that we cannot say anything about how things are before the act of measurement. What lesson can we draw from here? If I am right, then the problem lies not in reality or in quantum mechanics, but in the underlying mental imagery that produces our expectations. One way forward is to detach the meaning of the word real from the microstructure. Philosophers of science have made some recent advance, advances on this point. The key question in these debates was simple. Is water really just H2O? Many are now convinced that the answer is no. Equating reality with microessentialism makes us forget the essential role played by macro attributes. In the case of water, for instance, the boiling point, the latent heat, the conductivity are all very important. 
as are also the simple phenomenal qualities such as that water is a liquid, that it falls from the sky in the form of rain, and so on. The way water is part of the complex network of human practices is indispensable to understand this entity. This is not to say that the discovery that the water molecule is H2O was useless. It is not to say that the effort of so many exceptional quantum physicists is futile, not in the least. It is to say, rather, that the association of reality exclusively with the microstructure needs to be re-examined carefully. We need, perhaps, to leave the word real to refer primarily to what is important in everyday life and deriv derivatively to quantum mechanical equations and not the other way around. The correspondence principle in the broad sense remains important precisely because of the central role of the ontology of everyday life. Quantum mechanics has helped us become aware of this aspect of our underlying mental imagery and to overcome its limitations. The second section, questions concerning completeness. I come now to the second area that I want to explore, the one associated with the word completeness. For physicists, a complete theory about a system says all there is to say about that system. Of course, everyday situations are extremely complex. If the system is very simple, however, the hope of having a complete theory is reasonable. Now, quantum mechanics gives correct predictions even though it has strange consequences, like the collapse of the wave function. This means that the wave function describes the system as a combination of possibilities, while the act of a conscious mind reduces the set of possibilities into one, which we call actuality. My main concern here is not this mysterious act of consciousness, it is rather the question, what was the state of the system before the act of observation? We can follow the Copenhagen School, which holds that quantum mechanics is a complete theory. The superposition of possibilities indicated in the formalism contains all there is to say about the system. We cannot apply the normal predicates to the system before the acts of measurement. We just limit the semantic range of predicates. On this view, the question, what was the, the state of the system before the act of observation, that question is meaningless. This is one school of thought. The opposite school, well represented by Albert Einstein and David Bohm, holds that there must be a definite state of the system even before the collapse of the wave function. We might not yet have the physics to know it, but it is there. Every material particle has a determinate position. From this viewpoint, the Copenhagen interpretation is a cop-out. It is an evasion. It takes the wave function to be a mathematical representation of a particle state, and then, as it were, forgets the importance of the particle itself by focusing only on the state. <clears throat> this interpretation considers quantum mechanics a complete theory by simply denying the use of predicates for descriptions before the measurement. The realist school, on the contrary, defends determinism and admits that quantum mechanics is incomplete. This is a very simple version of the standard theory about the problems of interpretation. Now, I want to present a new reading of what is happening. I want to explore the underlying mental imagery. Two ideas have very deep roots. First, we have the Copenhagen interpretation's attitude of dodging the question of how things really are. This seems unacceptable. It seems to introduce an intolerable difference an intolerable difference between quantum mechanics and the rest of physics. Secondly, the realist's conviction that there must be a definite description of the world, whether we like it or not. This conviction seems rooted in the primordial idea of God, God's viewpoint, or divine omniscience. 
these deep roots derive, I claim, from the underlying mental imagery. Completeness and God's view seem to be coextensive concepts. A complete theory is not just true, it has maximal truth content. Of course, the idea of omniscience predates the scientific revolution by more than 2,000 years. It lies deep in our collective consciousness and is one of the major claims in most religions. With the rise of the empirical sciences, something very significant starts happening to the idea of divine omniscience. It starts to be modeled on human knowledge in a more direct way than ever before. In 1814, Pierre Simon de Laplace wrote about an infinite intelligence. I quote, an intellect which at a certain moment would know all forces that set nature in motion and all positions of all items of which nature is composed. If this intellect were also vast enough to submit these data to analysis, it would embrace in a single formula the movements of the greatest bodies of the universe and those of the tiniest atom. For such an intellect, nothing would be uncertain, and the future, just like the past, would be present before its eyes. This Laplacian intelligence becomes a substitute for divine omniscience. Notice what is happening here. The underlying mental imagery, the set of pre-conscious cognitive dispositions associated with the understanding of knowledge and divine omniscience, starts to take a definite shape because of science. Scholars start assuming that we know how God knows. God knows everything in exactly the same way as we would have known everything had we had full knowledge of all laws and initial conditions. Divine omniscience thus becomes equivalent to human knowledge extrapolated to infinity. Moreover, however, this, Lapla moreover, this Laplacian kind of omniscience becomes the aim of physics. Einstein was quite explicit on this point. He seemed quite happy to talk about the aim of physics together with all its religious overtones. Recall his famous statement, God does not play dice. In a sense, this transformation of the underlying mental imagery is the result of the correspondence principle in the broadest sense. Natural philosophers and scientists of the 17th and 18th centuries tried to improve conceptual consistency across disciplines by adjusting their view of divine omniscience. I am convinced that we are still affected by this transformed underlying mental imagery whenever we crave for full determinism, whenever we claim that even though the quantum mechanical formalism describes the system as a superposition, there is still a definite way that the system is in before measurement. There is, however, a serious problem. The transformed underlying mental imagery brings human and divine knowledge so close to each other that the difference between creator and created, creature and creator, decreases and nearly vanishes. We assume that the difference between God's knowledge of the world and our knowledge of the world is just a matter of content and speed of calculation. This happens when we use the word knowledge in the same way or univocally, whether we refer to God or to humans we end up with an excessively anthropomorphic understanding of divine omniscience, a caricature that is inconsistent, inconsistent with the idea of creation. If we recall other attributes of God, however, and other areas of our conceptual scheme regarding the divine, we will become aware that a univocal use of knowledge cannot possibly be right. The doctrine of creatio ex nihilo means that creation is a very special action. It is a relation between two completely different relata. 
God is absolutely independent, creation is absolutely dependent. God therefore does not know things like us. God knows them in a completely different way. He super knows them. Is there a way of fixing the underlying mental imagery here? Is there a way of, of overcoming the limitations that the mechanistic worldview imposed on the way we speak about God? The way forward, I propose, is to retrieve the logic of analogy. In general, analogy is a comparison between two things, a comparison that emphasizes similar aspects even though the things are different. How do we attribute meaning to the word knowledge? Divine knowledge is not what we are acquainted with first. We first grasp the idea of knowledge at the level of human capacities and then extend it to God. To this extension, however, we need to add the general awareness that God is the first cause and the perfect being in an absolute sense. We re recognize, therefore, that we apply the word knowledge fully and properly only when we apply it to God. Humans can indeed attain knowledge, but they do so only partially when compared to God. Notice how we are here using the word knowledge analogously. The relation between the human knower and the object known is similar to, but certainly not the same as, the relation between the divine knower and his own creation. This last point explains why human knowledge is essentially different from divine knowledge. It is different because God is creator, while a human is spectator. There's a great difference between creator and spectator. God knows things from the inside. We know things from the outside. Divine omniscience, therefore, cannot be just an enhanced version of human knowledge. Human knowledge would still remain deficient when compared to divine knowledge, even if humans were to know everything. So to recap the argument so far, I have explored the underlying mental imagery involved in debates about completeness and discovered that some traces of the mechanistic worldview should be corrected. My proposal was to abandon the idea that divine omniscience is a kind of enhanced human knowledge. If we abandon this idea and return to the debates in quantum mechanics, what do we obtain? Total determinism ceases to be an ideal. With the readjusted mental imagery, we are disposed to accept that the best knowledge is in terms of knowledge from within. If quantum mechanics is incomplete, therefore, it should not be a big problem. No physics can be, can be complete anyway. No physics can deliver knowledge of this world from within. If my proposal is correct, therefore, the readjustment of the underlying mental imagery favors an interpretation of the formalism somewhat in line with Kant's, Immanuel Kant's proposal of the noumenon or Aristotle's notion of prime matter. <coughs> Apparently, the readjustment I am defending favors instrumentalism. Conclusion. To conclude, let me recall the original question. What can we learn if we extend the correspondence principle all the way from quantum mechanics to theology? I focused on two issues only, reality and completeness. I know that nearly every point I mention merits deeper study and that my overall argument is probably not convincing to everyone. Nevertheless, I can at least indicate two lessons for us to learn. We need to avoid the idea that reality lies exclusively within the microstructure. We need to avoid also a univocal understanding of knowledge across disciplines. This is apparently the right way forward in our search for conceptual consistency in the broad sense. Thank you for your attention. Спасибо большое за очень интересный доклад. У меня два вопроса. 
Конечно, когда рождается Вселенная, непонятно, кто совершил редукцию и создал волновую функцию Вселенной. Это загадка. Тут можно говорить о божественном вмешательстве. Давайте попробуем смоделировать развитие Вселенной. Вот такая сумасшедшая идея прямо здесь за этим столом для того чтобы началась дифференциация в квантовой механике есть две части в ее теории это уравнение Шреддингера и соответственно волновая функция плюс акт редукции акт редукции совершается над волновой функцией совершается сторонним наблюдателем сторонней системы. Но помимо волновой функции Вселенной нет никакого пока наблюдателя. Некому совершать от акт редукции. Поэтому первичная дифференциация из чистого состояния с суперпозиции надо создать то, что называется матрицу плотности, то есть декогерентное состояние. Декогерентное. А у нас есть только одно когерентное. Кто будет осуществлять эту, эту первичную редукцию? Значит, здесь опять возникает идея Творца. Он должен вначале создать части, части этого мира, которые затем могут как-то взаимодействовать и возникнет редукция с помощью этих частей. Значит, вот до возникновения человека, до возникновения разума, тем самым должен быть какой-то сверхразум, который осуществляет эти акты. В свое время я Пригожин задавал вопрос, обсуждая проблему редукции в интерпретации фонема. Вы помните, что по Фонейману редукция происходит в сознании наблюдателя. Он задавал вопрос, кто до возникновения человека делал, какое сознание делало редукцию в природе, ну, развивались там звезды, человек еще нет. Возникает необходимость, ну, по крайней мере, первой дифференциации чистого состояния, это должно быть какое-то сверхсознание, которого просто еще и в помине нет. Вот правильно ли я понял, что для того, чтобы части познавали целое, они должны были возникнуть благодаря вот этому сверхнаблюдателю или творцу? Это вот первый вопрос. И второй. Вы говорите, что... Бог – это God is creator, man is что, spectator. То есть мы являемся, сами являемся наблюдать, наблюдательными приборами. А волновая функция, которая предъявлена в виде реальности божественной, вот мы ее осуществляем ее рецепцию. Вот. Но думаем, что в данном случае это наше откровение, наша свободная интерпретация. То есть проблема свободы здесь снимается в пользу божественного промысла. Это так? Спасибо. Thank you very much. Um, I am very interested in the proposal of seeing how uh, quantum mechanics can in fact leave a door open to some kind of proposal concerning super mind which in theological language would be the mind of God. However, I just mentioned two problems 
um, which are well known. First, the very idea of the collapse of the wave function is in fact a problem within the Copenhagen interpretation because the other interpretations, and there are competing ones at the moment, are meant precisely to avoid that. So the argument to derive some kind of existence or the need to propose a supermind to collapse the wave function, all that argument is within the Copenhagen interpretation, which is fine. The second problem I see in this line of argument is when we talk about the collapse of the wave function by a conscious act of measurement, there is a lot of vagueness about consciousness because we always assume that consciousness is human. The physicist with his microscope or his device. But as we know in our um, everyday life, there may be various grades of consciousness because we can ask, is your dog conscious? Does your dog see things happening? I think there is an element of simple consciousness in non-human animals. So there will be problems to solve when we use the word consciousness as some kind of determinant of reality. Because consciousness is not of one type only. It is a vague concept itself. I'm not, uh, I mean, I'm just adding some more interesting information to your proposal. Thank you very much for your talk. I have just a small question. Uh, what do you include in the conception of uh, underlying mental imagery? Thank you. Underlying mental imagery. I think this is the main instrument I use in this paper. Um, I try to explain it. Um, I'm becoming more and more convinced that we have unconscious habits of mind. What makes you say yes or no can be clearly defined reasons, but we normally answer yes or no to some question because of our previous conditioning. I think this is quite acceptable. What I'm proposing here is that this model of looking at what is not conscious, determining answers to questions, is very important and goes all the way back to our hominid ancestors. So um, I've tried to explain it briefly in one paragraph. I said, I am assuming that there is uh, underlying mental, has to do with concepts, imagery. I use that word imagery. The idea is an image, you appreciate an image before you can put words on it. Sometimes if you explain why is this painting gripping to me, you destroy it. In a sense, you bring it, you make it, you never describe fully that initial um, link you have with that picture. So an image goes beyond um, our explicit list of reasons. Um, I think there is a lot of interesting dynamics there happening between a kind of habit which is not yet articulated, it is implicit. A habit is like a disposition to go this way rather than that way. And what we then articulate as reasons or as assumptions. The reasons and assumptions are the explicit form of what lies implicit. This is how, this is the, as it were, the background of my my paper. So you you don't include any explicit uh, conceptions or uh, I'm sorry, uh, you don't include in the imagery explicit conceptions or word use or something like that. 
No, I include them, but the, what we take as explicit assumptions have already existed there as dispositions. Uh, it's like discovering our dispositions by articulating some of them. This is what I, when we say, what are our assumptions here? What made me answer yes or no? And I think it's one of the major works, tasks of the philosopher to try to uncover or try to explore deeper and deeper what is making, making me decide this way rather than that way. And this can go either through a, a very serious um, study of history or like what some French philosophers call the gene genealogy of, of knowledge, for instance, Foucault and archaeology of knowledge, that sort of thing. Предложение предыдущего вопроса. Скажите, пожалуйста, а вот, э, вот эта внутренняя система образов человека, она имеет э, какую-то аналогию э, писаний или в каких-то других, может быть, священных текстах? find in the Holy Scripture is um, an interpretation of the life story of a big group of people, the Old Testament for instance, an interpretation of what happened in the light of some important major insights that they are the chosen people for instance, the people of Israel. For instance, that what is happening to them is providential, that their problems can be interpreted as punishment from God, for instance. These are assumptions that are at work in the interpretation of their life story. So, what I've been said, to talking about, like underlying mental imagery, can be useful to understand the formation of scripture as well. Now, of course, I'm not denying that there is the action of the Holy Spirit in the actual writing of these uh, inspired texts. Well, my suggestion is that we need to consider, you know, that we have dispositions that we are not aware of. We need to think clearly to be aware of what is making us decide one way or the other. Um, sometimes in the scriptures you, ha you have cases of very radical changes. For instance, conversion of Saint Paul. He used to have a set of dispositions this way, and then in a very short time he had to change everything, a new way of reacting to reality. So. I think it can be also useful in understanding scripture. But I, in this paper certainly, I am not justifying the use of the concept of underlying mental imagery by use of the scripture. I'm not saying it is useful because it's used in the scripture. I mean, it's, it's another, it's a different idea. I'm not justified through theological arguments. Thank you, Luis. I sympathize very much with almost everything you said. I especially endorse this this idea of <clears throat> yeah, a certain priority of, of our life world and your refusal to begin doing philosophy at the micro level and reconstruct the world bottom up. So, so that's uh, something I would really uh, underpin. I, I have a question to you just historically. Many things you said reminded me uh, to 
some earlier Jesuit philosophers uh, with whom I was taught in, in, in my own studies, people like uh, Joseph Marichal and Emmerich Koret. So they, they also had this idea of a transcendental philosophy beginning by yeah, the very act of questioning, uh, constantly adjusting our categories, uh, perhaps getting rid of uh, misleading mental imagery, but everything under the principle of non-contradiction and everything with the desire to get to get a, a coherent and, and consistent picture of reality where also questions of faith, for instance, have, have their place. So I want to ask you for the, for the heroes in the background. Uh, is a part of your gallery of heroes also people like yeah, Lonergan, Coret, uh, Marichal, or uh, do you rely on other um, traditions here? I, of course, read Lonergan and some Marichal as well. Coret, less. Um, when I write a paper, I usually try to defend the argument as I am presenting it, uh, with as little reference to or authoritative justification as possible. Sure. <laughs> I certainly am not an autodidact, so I did not fall from the sky, and I, I, I learned a lot of things from many, many people. Um, I just want to add, however, that a friend of mine, Jerry Whelan, who is quite knowledgeable on Lonergan, said that some of what I said do not, doesn't correspond exactly with what Lonergan says. Um, so I'm looking forward to meeting Jerry Whelan when I go back home <laughs> to discuss these points. Um, especially as regards um, intuition. This word was used in one of our papers this morning, intuition or insight. It seems that some of the philosophers you mentioned had a special role for insight. They say we can arrive at the truth at some moment and be sure of it. Um, I'm somewhat skeptical about that perhaps because of my background. So there are some differences. Thank you.